Oh, miigwech. Mm -hmm. Uju. Miigwech. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Marni and Dijnikaz. Gawin and Doro Damasin. Bujwikwidong and Dunjaba. Onaka Minsing and Da. Miigwech. Meet you. Thank you all for being here. This is Marnie Keski. I'm the cultural preservation specialist with the 1854 Treaty Authority. And uh, I oversee the education and outreach program for the organization. I am here today with my partner in crime, Keisha Stoll. Hey, Keisha, she is the marketing coordinator for the St. Louis County Historical Society. So welcome to our final in the series of Kikinu Amagawin Ijitwawin Gaye Gikenda Suwanan Maui, Mamawi. Ojibwe teachings, culture, and science come together. This partnership program series between our two organizations has been a huge hit. We're wondering why we hadn't done it before. Um, Chimi Gwetch, for those who have joined us for one or more of our events. Uh, we'd appreciate your feedback, as always. So heads up, we are going to send out a program evaluation tomorrow. We really appreciate your feedback. <clears throat> Keisha, would you care to share about the history people? Absolutely. I'm from the St. Louis County Historical Society. Uh, we were established in 1922, so we're actually coming up on 100 years. Next year's our 100 year. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that later uh, in the months to come. But uh, our mission really is we collect, preserve, and present history. Uh, because history defines who we are today and helps us navigate tomorrow. So. And a big part of our history here in Northeast Minnesota is the Ojibwe Nation. Um, so this is why we're very happy to, to partner and to, uh, to learn with everyone else. That's awesome. And for those of you that are not familiar with 1854, uh, we are an intertribal natural resource management agency working for both the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, we are tasked with two items. One to protect off reservations, treaty rights harvest, as well as implement the programs of hunting, fishing, gathering off reservation for our tribal members. Um, that's all in the, 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 the ceded lands, the lands that were given over, handed over to the United States government in the year of 1854, all of present day Northeastern Minnesota. Uh, we are delighted to have Boys for it Elder Karen Drift with us from Asabikone, Gaza'agan, Net Lake. Karen is a big advocate of preserving Ojibwe culture through language and stories. So we're so appreciative she's willing to do so with us tonight. Uh, then we're gonna hear from 18 fisheries, 1854 fisheries staff, Nick Bogio and Tony Anselmo. Today they speak for the sturgeon. They plan to entertain us with some ways that Name sturgeon is one of the most unique fish found in the Great Lakes, and then describe one of the most successful restoration ecology projects in the area. We have so little time uh, spared for some Q&A at the end of tonight. And um, we are hosting today's program in a webinar format. So if you could, please type your comments and questions in the chat and Keisha and I will do our best to moderate those, get those questions to the right folks at the end. Um, be sure to stick around because Keisha is gonna be giving away some prizes and raffle at the ending of this evening, uh, but you have to be present to win. Um, another thing too, she'll be, she'll be pulling the names from the registrations, um, but she'll have to cross check that with who is actually attending our, our session tonight. Last week, there was somebody that attended and won a prize and we couldn't find their contact info because they didn't register. So please do get your registration in. Um, so we can get you your prizes. Again, we appreciate you all being here. Um, and I'm going to interrupt here for just a second, Marnie, since we're talking about that. Again, comparing the list of participants with the list of registrants. So I know some of you have signed in with a single name. Uh, it, it's very helpful if you could add your last name in or an initial on the participant list or send me a note in the, the chat box. You know, I want to make sure if there are five Lisas, I want to make sure it goes to the right Lisa. So please, please give me some kind of indicator as to your last name. Thank you. So I thought we would uh, start with a little, a little word from Michelle. Uh, Michelle is kind of a, 
the brains behind this operation. She serves as both the St. Louis County Historical Society uh, president, board president, as well as 1854's financial officer. She wants to say a few words about um, kind of the background and how this program came together. Bonjour, Michelle Hakwavitsva, Vishnikovs, Nigizi and Odem, Kitchiona de Ming and Dunjaba, Masave Tang and Dam. So I told you my name is Michelle Hakwavitsva. I'm Eagle Clan. I'm a Grand Portage in Raleigh, and I live in Duluth. I use the word uh, Masave Tang, which means uh, the land of the giants which is one of the names for the Duluth area. So like Marie said, I am the president of the Board of Governors at the St. Louis County Historical Society. I also serve on the American Indian Advisory Committee there. Uh, the Historical Society is kind of unique in that they're one of the few museums in the area that had started an American Indian Advisory Committee back in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, that kind of thing just wasn't being done, you know, long before we kind of got into this era of uh, inclusion and uh, proper voicing. And it was actually my mother that uh, started that with our executive director, Joanne Toom. So I'm second generation at the Historical Society. I kind of picked up there. We uh, have kind of a small committee, but we have representatives from Fond du Lac, who's uh, Vern Zacher, Boyce Flort, that's Jalen Strong. Uh, Nick Gillespie is an at-large member, and he uh, was a teacher out at Fond du Lac Community College. And right now our Grand Portage proper member is vacant. We had uh, Marianne uh retired on us so we're, we're still looking for a replacement there so just to give you some background about what the idea here was you know at the uh our committee has the mission of educating the public on native culture sharing that with the non-natives as well as our native culture and we really wanted to try to change some of those misperceptions that are out there, give people a bigger understanding of who the local Ojibwe people are, that we're still a modern culture, we exist today, and what that culture looks like today, the things that we are living and doing today, that we don't just exist in the past. So the other thing is that, you know, when people think about Native people, they don't always think about science, right? Um, that's really, probably not one of the first things that are going to pop into people's minds. But working here at the Treaty Authority, uh, you know, I, I saw this great work being done by our staff, and I just really wanted to share that. And that was something that probably wasn't out there in the community. But we always want to remember and infuse that we're doing this within the context of our of our culture. It isn't either or. It isn't something we've ad adopted, right? We're putting our own our own culture into it and remembering those cultural values. So one of those values, and we're just going to give you a heads up about tonight. Um, we're probably going to go long. Okay, we, that is a, kind of the way we operate. Um, we have a very different idea about elders. I think sometimes in the non-native community, elders are maybe seen as not being useful or maybe have lost some of their smarts or don't really have anything to contribute. In Ojibwe culture, native culture, anyone I've ever seen, um, it's the exact opposite. Those are our teachers they're highly respected. And so when an elder is giving us a teaching, we respectfully listen and we don't interrupt. So a lot of native programming a, is probably going to start late, although we started really well on time today. Yay. But it goes as long as it needs to go. When the spirits are talking through that teacher, 
and the things that we're sharing and the discussions we're having, we just let them go. We let, we let those spirits go. Or we let them speak to us. So we're just going to give you a heads up on that. You know, no one's being held hostage here. If you got to leave at seven o'clock, feel free to leave. Okay. And I know it's hard. You don't want to miss things, but that's part of our culture. Okay. So that's where we're putting in here tonight. And that's just really what I wanted to share with you this evening. Neil, miigwech. Thank you. That's all I have. Miigwech. What do you think, Karen? Do you want to share with us? Well, I can introduce myself first, then I'll share stuff. I'll share things what you want to, you know. Well, Wuju, my name is Karen Drift. I'm a boy sport elder. I grew up in Net Lake since birth. I was brought up in a traditional Anishinaabe speaking home. I am a fluent speaker and I know the boy sport dialect. I know, I know the seasonal traditional activities year round. I know all the current Minnesota state. I worked as the language table instructor for the past two years and volunteered teaching Anishinaabe for the past eight years for the Boy Sport Anishinaabe Language Immersion Camp. I presented Anishinaabe community tradition storytelling and presentations for other Anishinaabe reservations. As a child, I was raised by my grandparents who spoke only Anishinaabe Who's this? My grandpa spoke a little English, but not much. My grandma didn't speak at all. Anishinaabe language was my first language. I have taught classes for many years in my community, which is a boys' sport reservation. Uh, childhood, early childhood development association. I got certified in 18, 1984 and, re, and renewed my certification every four years. I have conducted teachings in Head Start programs on other reservations, including Fond du Lac, Keweenaw Bay, Grand Portage, and Duluth, and how to teach native language in the classroom. In 1994, I attended Lakehead University in Thunder Bay and completed a native language instructor program. In 2007, I, I co-produced a language CD with uh, a Native American recording artist, Keith Sicola. The, the, the CO produced CD, produced a CD. It was nominated for the Native American Music Awards and won the NAMI for the best ling linguistic recording. I have served on various committees in my community over the years. I'm still doing it. Neil. So that's one thing. That's one thing I'm never going to give up. My, my teaching a language until, until, you know, I'm getting up there in age, so, but I'll just keep on. Me ill, me ill, me gwech to give you some dawi aid. Thank you for listening. Me gwech, Karen. And you, I first met you when you gave a little blessing and a story at the Boys Fort um, netting clinic about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was so cool because I had I had never really heard of um, the fish clan at the time. And you shared a few a few stories about uh, what that role in fish clan means. Do they have a fish clan up in Boys Fort? Yeah, they they have like the uh, the uh, walleye, oga, they have the sturgeon, they have whitefish, they have uh, 
sucker, Namabini, and they have the northern, and then they have, yeah, and then they have, uh, I think that's all of, that's all, oh, they have other water, well, what ones that, you know, that are water, they live in the water, like the muskrat, they have them kind of clans, the beaver clan, uh, yeah, the, all the water, water, uh, animals, the, the Mickinock, the turtle, you know, there's no turtle clans up here, because I was told that the only place that the turtle clan came from was from the east, out east. But then they talk a lot about the turtle up here too, making up, you know. They, uh, I wrote something down about that. They, uh, yeah, I, I know a few people that, that were like, they are the Sturgeon clan. And I know some that are the, the Bullhead clan. I tease my kids about the Bullhead clan. I said, that should be your clan because you're bullheaded. No. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I got, a, there's a lot of, like uh, northern pike, walleye, sturgeon, whitefish, sunfish, bass, minnow, sucker. And we never, we never had no bullhead in our lake before until some couple men come up here and they, there was a man on, a, on the top of the hill. They asked if they could plant bullheads in our lake. And this old man, he didn't have the right to do that. And uh, he was Gilshkwebi when he, he let them put bullheads in our lake, in our water. Now that's just, they were just full of bullheads. You know, they, we used, they used to set net long time ago on boys sport. They had, uh, you know, mostly suckers they had um, Namabin, that's a sucker, Namabin, and they all the, then long time ago, it was the ladies' job to set net. Only ladies did that. And uh, we they put out tobacco before they went out on a lake to set a net. And, uh, you no, know, it was, I, it was their job now. Now today, it's anybody's job. You know, the men can go out there and set they set nets and tower at uh, you know uh, when the walleyes are running. But you know how things change. You know how how up on the boys' sport there used to be a uh, can or uh, not uh, smoking. Smoke and uh, wigwams all over. Everybody would be smoking suckers. They'd use that willow. That that's the one that smolders. That's what they would use. They'd have like three three racks on their uh in their tea in their teepee. Their what they'd make. And you know that I used to like they. Like they said, Indians eat everything. That's, you know, and I remembered my grandma cooking the fish heads, you know, everything. She wouldn't uh, waste nothing from the fish. She'd, uh, when she'd even boil them uh, fish eggs that were in the fish and, uh, I can't remember taste, I can't, but I must, I tasted them. And I like sucker heads. I used to like sucker heads. Now <laughs> I wouldn't care for any, I don't know. And I used to like muskrat because my uh, uncles, I had six uncles 
and they were all, they lived all, we had a place where it was called like Strongville. All the Strongs lived. It was like in a circle where all the houses were. And I had like the, how they said years ago, there was a scout in your family. There was a hunter in your family there, you know, my one uncle, he was the hunter. He'd go out in the winter time with snowshoes and with a gunny pack sack, him and like a hunting party, like four. They'd go walk across the lake and they'd be gone. They'd be gone like for two days, maybe three. They'd come back with, with pack sacks full of uh, wawashkeshi weas. That's deer meat. And then in a, around February, I think, they would go out by what the river is called, uh, Wood Duck River we have out there. And they'd go and uh, spear fish out there. They'd get them little bitty tiny kind of fish. I think they were called Genuje. No, they weren't either. They must have been, uh, I, I can't remember the name of them, but that's why they bring in gunny sacks full of them little bitty fish. And they were just kind of, maybe they were little sunfish, I don't know. But that the men would do that. But then the ladies too, all the ladies would be out there sitting with a blanket over their head or something. They'd be, they'd go pick a bunch of cedar and they'd put that around around where their fish hole was and they would they would fish you know keep warm with that cedar where they sat on then when they get done they would clear everything out of there you know not make a mess and but yeah I remember all of that when cleaning fish we all the kids had to help clean fish we had to scale the fish but not, uh, last, that was last year, I, I got some uh, fish in, uh, I think it was Northern uh, Genuche is Northern. And anyway, I had three of my grandsons. I was gonna show them how to do it, how to clean a fish. And I said, after this, the other three are going to learn. The three were just like small, like maybe eight, nine, maybe 10. We had them fish on a table out there. We had a cardboard and then uh, I showed them how to scale the fish. And after I showed them how to cut to get the guts out, you should have seen them boys. All three of them were gagging. They were almost throwing up. And I said, you guys aren't supposed to do this. I said, you're supposed to know how to clean fish and ducks. Same thing with ducks. They pulled the feathers off and they, we uh, torched them with a blowtorch and then we cut them up and the girls did that, but they were better. They didn't uh, kind of almost throw up. But And then when we were kids, we went, got right in there with our hands and pulled the guts out of the duck and we uh, cleaned the fish and you know, anything. We had to do that when we were when we were little, they taught us early, but then there was nothing to keep us busy like they have today, like all them cell phones and TV. And I never had a TV until we, I was 13. Then they got one, it was all black and white. And to this day, I'm not interested in TV because I didn't grow up with it. I. Uh, well, right now, though, I watch, the only time I watch TV is 10 o'clock news. Me had to go. Nigi Wapendan, Missinate Sejigan. 
I just watch TV. But yeah, there were a lot of stuff. That's all we lived on was wild meat, like deer, moose, beaver, muskrat, rabbit, you know, um, what else did we, porcupine and ducks and geese and fish. You know, there, I never really knew about sturgeon, sturgeon because, you know, we lived way, what would, what I would call the, on the, the poor side of town. We didn't, you know, it was in the other side of town is where the men would go fishing. They, they have everything like, I remember seeing their great big boots you know, they'd go down a Little Fork River and they'd uh, go catch uh, sturgeon. And uh, they would uh, be, the only thing I seen from them was pictures. They took pictures of, uh, they must have them pictures around Net Lake here somewhere of, uh, because when we were in grade school, they showed us uh, pictures of the men uh, sturgeon fishing. They they had little cheap uh, cameras or whatever, but they worked, you know. But yeah, I, uh, and then like I told you, you know, it, it's a it was a lady's job to set net, and you know, and then the young boys went. Uh, they made their own little uh, fishing rods, my cousins, and they go fish early in the morning out on the lake here. They go get old sturdy poles in the woods and they get some, uh, that what they call weegub. It's a real, it's a real uh, tough string. And they put safety pins They'd have them great big safety pins that they'd use them for babies' diapers or something when they used to have. And they'd put that uh, that string through that hole and they'd tie it. And they, my grandma was really stingy with their salt pork. <laughs> Here the boys would go steal. They they go take her salt pork, and they'd cut it in little bitty chunks. And that's what they would use for bait. And you know, just they go early in the morning. That's when they'd uh, go to the island. And but they always took their tobacco with them when they went to the island, or go on the lake, go hunting. They would always put sama down before they, or they. Uh, my granddaughter, she uh, she met a a young man. He's enrolled in Cass Lake. Anyway, she, uh, but he was brought up in a, in a home, in a, in a home with non-Indians. And he didn't know nothing about hunt or fishing or anything. So he said, oh, I can't catch no fish. He was saying, I don't know why. And I told him, did you? put some tobacco out when you go to the lake, go put some tobacco in the water. You don't, it don't have to be much, just a pinch. So he did that. They went fishing down at Farmer John's and they got back and I said, well, did you catch a gigo? I said, yeah, he said, you know, that works, he said. I put my sama in the water and I caught, I kept catching gigu, I kept catching fish. See, I said, you weren't paying. You weren't paying to go fishing. I said, you were just, you know, we gotta pay, pay to do, go get a deer. We gotta pay to, um, you know, just go get medicine out in the woods and we gotta, pay when we pick blueberries and 
royal wild rice, everything, you know, even medicine. We got to pay every time. Not much, just a little pinch. And then at the end of the season, we have ceremonies for, for what we get. You know, we have feasts like uh, this. Uh, we'll have uh, walleye pretty soon. As soon as the uh, lake opens and there's some people that give elders gigu. And what I do when they give me some, I have like a feast. I cook like walleye and maybe pinin, potatoes, and mandamin, corn. And then I, I go burn some. You know, I go outside and I burn some in a fire along with Sama. And then that's, you know, what we're paying for eating the walleye. The, the oga, and then same way with blueberries. When blueberries come in them, in uh, probably June, I mean July, we go. I used to go picking all the time. We used to go down a river, and one of my uncles was what you would call a scout. He would go down just when he knew the blueberry leaves were coming out. He'd go down, paddle down to a uh, lost river over there, and he'd keep track on the berries, how they were growing. And on the probably about two days before they were growing, or he'd come and he'd tell, tell everybody there that would go pick and he'd say, they're going to be ready. They're going to be ready for pretty soon, maybe within three, four days. So everybody would pack up and take boats. We take, we had like, uh, we take like five boats and they take us kids out there to pick for school clothes, you know, to buy stuff. And uh, we'd go there and we'd set up camp, you know, we'd have wigwams there because we couldn't afford tents, you know. We'd cook outside and there'd be like four kids that would go along and help help the elders pick me and on berries, you know, and in every season we'd come back, we'd we'd have a feast right out there with the blueberries. And um, we, you know, because there was a lot of adults there, you know, even other families would come there. And then when that was over, then then it was coming like fall and then we'd go pick like there'd be like choke cherries cranberries you know we go pick all of them pinch it well i don't think pinch cherries pinch cherries grew around june but uh in the fall that's when choke cherries and cranberries we had a lot right right beside in our the woods down there there was big cranberry bunch of cranberry trees and but like each season we like right now it's um sugar sugar time sugar sap time and there's a lot of them out there that are I couldn't go there I'm too old you know I can't walk in the woods but I see some younger people now there's only like maybe three or four families out there that are, they're doing maple sugar. And that's, uh, you know, that's what they do too. They have a feast in the fall. You know, they have everything, berries, everything that is uh, wild, you know, they have, like, you know, it's just, it's this, there's so many different kind of, there's so many different kind of uh, ceremonies. That's we wonderful, do, Karen. They're called, them feasts that we, we have, they're called Wikundiwin. 
or week from day. But yeah, there's all kinds naming, you know, and like uh, I could talk all night about uh, ceremonies, but like, you know, even naming there. In fact, I just had a little great granddaughter born here a week ago. She lives in uh, Berga, Michigan. And uh, I'm going down there to give her an Indian name, probably in around April. And uh, she's only like a week old. And they told us, get your names early. Get your names early, don't wait. And that's what I did to all my kids and my grandkids and all my, my uh, Don Kubidog and my great grandkids. But I want them all to have Indian names. There's a whole bunch of stuff about Indian names too, what could happen. But, you know, if you don't get your name. And there's, there's a thing about dreams. Dreams are you know, are important to Anishinaabe. I know, I think, you know, they used to tell us, my grandma used to say, tell us everything. She used to say about your dreams. She used to say, uh, listen, when you have a dream, she'd say, someday you'll know the purpose of what you dream, she used to say, but just make sure make sure that you you know because somebody some the, that's how we uh, communicate with the spirits through dreams Anishinaabe do and my son come to me one time and he said ma he said I go in the gibo see he said I don't dream and I used to and he sobered up when he was 16 years old. And when he was about 30, 30 some, he started drinking. And he come to me and he said, I don't, I can't dream anymore. I said, do you know why you can't dream? I told him, because you have alcohol in your brain. I said, that's like a big cobweb in there. I said, it's your dreams can get through there, I told him. And, you know, and that's what I was told, you know, have a clear mind. I know if I take, if I take Tylenol, I, I, I don't dream. It, you know, that's like, I don't know what, but I was told a lot of things about committing suicide and, you know, all that about uh, about how long time ago we used to go to uh, other peace people's houses to uh, go have a weekend doing or a feast. I used to go along with my grandma all the time because uh, if they were on a manome and wild rice, they would have raisins and white rice they would cook. And we went to this one place, it was called uh, Burnsides. It was just in the woods. We didn't have no really roads here, just trails. And I used to go there down a the trail. And we'd go to that house and there'd be all elders there sitting in a circle. And uh, they were, they couldn't sit on the floor because they were kind of too old because, you know, but, uh, I would sit on the floor by my grandma and they had like a great big white dish pan in the middle of the floor with raisins and white rice. But I just went, I wanted to go along with my grandma to the, uh, with that ceremony because I knew that lady was making uh, raisins and white rice. And I just wanted to take the raisins off the, out of the rice and eat them. But that's all I used to do. 
and then they would uh, they would nago mischige. That means making a batch for because no alcohol was was uh, allowed on our reservation. There used to be sneak and bootleggers in here, but they used to make naga mischige. It's called raisin wine. And they do that like New Year's. And um, we'd see how much they have. They put a whole 10 pound bag of sugar in there. They use that yeast and that malt. We used to watch them make naga mischige. Then anyway, we we liked raisins, me and my cousin. And after they would get, they'd pour that, get that whole batch ready, that old raisin wine, and then they'd leave the, uh, the raisins on the bottom and out of that big uh, keg. They had like kegs, eight gallon, five gallon, you know, and uh, we, uh, me and my cousin would go there and we go dig in that keg and take a cup full of raisins and we'd eat them. Here later on, we'd be sleeping, eating that there must have been alcohol in the raisins. And we would we'd eat them raisins. So we probably kind of get, you know, we just go to sleep. And, you know, but there's a lot of things that we did. Same way with uh, nobody at Strongville at my, my house smoked cigarettes when we were little. They all chewed snuff. All my uncles, my aunts, they chewed snuff. And uh, we tried it, we tried to steal some some snuff from my cousin's dad and ma. How we see how they put it in under their lip. We tried it. We took a half a can of snuff and and oh, we got sick. We were we were throwing up and just dizzy. We never tried that again. But then when when cigarettes were going, coming around, there was a lot of them, but still nobody smoked cigarettes at Strongville. There was still snuff, but I don't know. Uh, we used to go down to the lake and uh, we seen cigarettes. We used to go down to the lake and we'd go pick dry weeds and we'd steal book mat, uh, farmer matches from our, that's, that's the only thing they used. They never had no lighters or they'd use uh, farmer matches and big stick matches. And we'd go down by the lake and we'd make a uh, same, big, same as a, a cigarette, Sam Paul Goss. That's how you say cigarette, Sam Paul Goss. And we'd light that match and we'd put it that uh, dry weed in our, and we'd puff on it and we'd blow out, blow in like smoke. We didn't know how to inhale or nothing, you know? And uh, so that's what we would do. And I told my, I told my grandkids one time, that we were about, nine years old when we used to do that, me and my cousin Clara and my cousin Sarah, three of us would go down there. And I said, did you kids know? Do you know? I said, grandma, do you know that grandma used to smoke weed when she was nine years old? But there wasn't even no, that around yet until later, you know? But uh, they were laughing because, you know, that was, I was already in my 30s and I was telling them about, about what we used to do and, 
you know. There's a lot of, like they say, that's our drugstore out there in the, in the woods, Nopaming. But that's, you know, that's just uh, how we lived. You know, we didn't have no running water or no electricity or no, no electricity, nothing, you know. We never even had butter. We'd use lard for our butter. I have bannock and we'd put lard on there. But, you know, and we, one time, somebody knew about a toaster anyway, but uh, my grandpa used, he, be, he had an old coffee can. They used to be only about that big, them coffee cans. And he got one. And he, he drilled holes, well, he made holes on each side of, uh, each on a core out. And he put wire around, around there to make it like in the crops. And we had an old wood stove, a kitchen stove where they used to cook. And that was our toaster, that coffee, that, that old coffee can. And it worked good, you know. We, so they they thought of everything, you know. Anishinaabeg from Meoja, long time ago. You know they, and then we'd watch. That's how. And that's what my cousin said. How do you, how did you know a lot? She said. I said, you all, you know what I did? I said, I watched grandma all the way ever since. I said, she used to take care of me when I was like six months old. I said, she couldn't even talk. And she used to take care of me and talk Indian to me all the time and, you know, tell me things. She told me about suicide. She talked to me about suicide. There's so many things that, that she talked to me about. Anything else? Mi aja, mi aja. Bejik nishiswe niwa nana ningadaswe. Nishwaswe. Dubai Ganek, seven o'clock. <laughs> you tired of listening? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never, Karen. Your words are like gold. <laughs> Thank you much for sharing. We learned a lot tonight. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Oh, I didn't go through uh I didn't go through uh the clans, but I was gonna tell you a little uh Manabushu story. There's still some snow behind my house. This is about gigu, a fish, you know, but uh, I told that, did I, you, I think I told you that one there with you and uh, 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 Mackenzie and uh, uh, one time uh, the Makwa and the fox, Mongush, were sitting on a bank. Did I tell you that? You probably heard that one. They maybe, were sitting... maybe, but we have a lot of people here that should hear it. Are you willing to tell it? Yeah. Okay. There was a, a Makwa, a bear, and a Mongush fox. There is sitting on the Makwa was sitting at the bank, and the, the fox. The fox walked by, went by. He had a, a big string of gigu on his shoulder. And uh, he had like maybe six or whatever on there. And that, that bear of Makwa was hungry. And he said, hey, Wagush, where did you get all the gigu? And the Wagush said, I got him. I got him down by the river, by the river. And he said, I'm hungry. He said, 
do you think I could go get some? How did you get them? And the fox said, the, the uh, Wagush told him, just go dig a hole in the ice. And, and so Bear, the Makwa, was kind of weary about listening to him. Finally, he was getting more, more buck a day, more hungry. So he said, oh, I think I'll do it. I'm gonna go get me some gigu. So he went and he dug a, dug a hole there and the fox, the uh, wagash told him, he long time ago, the Makwas had big long tails. They had long tails. And uh, he said, stick your tail in a, to get fish, they'll hang on to your tail. And, and then when you feel that getting heavy, pull it out. But you're gonna have to stay there a long, long time. He said, sit here for a long time. So Makwa did. And here that uh, ice was starting to freeze freeze over and his feet were getting cold and everything and uh, so he tried to pull he tried to pull away and he couldn't he was stuck tight so then finally he did he he made a big jerk there and he pulled out but his tail come off he didn't get no fish and uh so it was hurting him really bad because his tail was off. And they say that that is why Bear has that little bitty tail. He don't really have a tail. But then I wanted, uh, I was thinking, Bears hibernate in the winter. And it was, he stuck his, oh, well, they said, well, that's an Anabaju story. <laughs> They're starting to question, you know. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of stories in Nanabuju. You can only tell them in the winter, but you can tell them, you know, until there's no snow left. And there's little patches. I got a big patch of snow on the back of my house. So when that's over, I'll be able not to be able to say tell but anyway they they uh they said that uh they used to tell us that you can tell uh, the first snowfall you can tell a story in all through the winter you can tell a story and then around february they said to start over again start telling the stories over again and uh so the kids will learn, they'll hear them over, over. And, you know, that's, that's what I, that's what I do. I, like I told, I've been telling stories and I've been tell, telling them over and, and they say, you know, to me, every, every Nanabushu story has a teaching of some kind, you know, like I told that story of uh, uh, how Nanabushu changed himself into a wolf. You know, I told that one. And you've told that already. I said, no, this is a story about, I said, oh, you know, and uh, now you'll know, I told him, you'll know. You know, there's a lot of, I look in the, to the, behaviors, you know, about what Nana was doing and about that one where uh, Nana was doing and his Nukumis went out for a walk and she wanted to show him something. He was only a young boy then. And she wanted to show him something and it was uh, in the summer. And they went walking and he kept throwing rocks and throwing, he wouldn't, he wouldn't listen to her. 
finally, she got mad at him and said, you better listen. You better learn what uh, what's going on out there. Now watch. Now watch what what's going to happen, she said, when we're on our long walk. So he, he started listening, and then they seen a, a snake, Genebic. Then they seen a makaki, a frog. And uh, that uh, snake was chasing that frog. And Nukumis told Nanabashu, watch what's going to happen now, watch, she's told him. And that uh, snake was cr uh, slowly crawling up and that frog would jump and hop and he would right behind him. And, and then they, he was almost catching him and he told him, he said, he told the grandma, told uh, Nanabashu, watch now what happens. He's, the uh, snake is either going to get him and eat him, or he's going to find somehow to get away, to get away from him. So he said they they kept walking, and they were, pretty soon they came upon a great big bush, like it wasn't high. Uh, it wasn't high. It was just a big bush, and uh, so that's where that amaka key ran. In that in that bush, and that snake must have knew what kind of bush that was or what it was. He wouldn't go in there. And uh, finally, he was in there waiting for him to come out, but uh, Makaki wouldn't come out. And uh, Ginebig was just getting hot. It was really hot. He said. Oh, I'm so hot. I, then there was a, a river close by. He could see it. He said, oh, I wish I could go down to that river and just lay in the water and cool off. So he said, oh, I'll wait for him to come out for a little in a little while. So he waited and he waited and finally he said, oh, I gotta go cool off. So the Ganebig went went down into that little uh, that little where it was a little stream or a little water and he went and he laid in that water and he said oh this feels so good and, and cool cooling off and the muckety thought oh he's gone I can I can get out now I can go in that uh, that Ganebig and he probably fell asleep or something slept there long and then the, the Makaki started uh, hopping away and uh, Nukumis said now watch what's gonna what what uh, he's doing and uh, so they they followed him and he he uh, hopped about I don't know how many steps he hopped and finally he he hopped into this bush this these like plants. And when he hopped in there, Nukumis said, watch what he's gonna do now. So they watched there and Makaki start kind of rolling and everything in a, in a bush. And uh, here, what he was doing uh, Ginebic chased him into a bunch of poison ivy and he was just itchy and everything. So he went and he went into them, them uh, bushes and, and they said that's how uh, their bushes are. I see that once in a while. You break them open and there's something white coming out of there. It looks like lotion, white lotion. And that's what that uh, makaki put all over his body for the itch. And sure enough, that's what they say. That's, you know, that's used for poison ivy or any, any kind of itch. So that was a, a learning 
that was a learning uh, a learning experience there, you know, for Nana Bajou. But uh, you know that. And then another thing is, uh, like I said, I never heard of uh, anybody having a turtle clan only out east. Story about, there's a story about uh, the mud, the, the, or oh, the mud, little muskrat and um, turtle to make the aki, to make the earth. That was even before people were on earth, only the animals were here. And then it was when animals, that's, uh, that's when uh, they said Nanabushu gave all the animals jobs to do what, like the Wawashke, she said, I'll feed the people that are hungry. The Gigu said, do you know, they would, they, they got all kinds of jobs anyway for, from Nanabushu in that same way with that color. There's another story about the color. They said long, Mewisha, they said a lot of, lot of, all the birds were white only. They were all white. There was no color. They had different sounds of their, their voice. I mean, their, how they sounded, but it was just that they were all, they were white, wapshke, wapshke bineshiug, white birds. They, and Nanabushu said, everybody, he called all of Bineshi together. He said, everybody, come, everybody come here early in the morning, daybreak, just when this, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you something, he told him. And so the birds were just excited. They, they got up really early and they all took off. And Nanabushu was waiting for them and he had a bunch of different colors on a big long, I don't know what it was, where he was doing there, doing his, anyway, like he, he must have made his colors, like they say, blueberries are purple, strawberries red, you, you make colors out of the plants. Anyway, he told, he talked to them. He said, I wanna give everybody a color and there was a big bunch of Bineshi lined up there. And the first one that came was a OPG, a Robin. And he asked, what color would you like? And he said, red, a little bit gray, black feet. Uh, you know, all, he named what he wanted. And uh, Madame Bouchou made him that way, painted him or something. And next one come a little, like a little yellow bird. He wanted yellow, black. And um, so they were getting, they were all getting, did they tell him what color they wanted? Like a Nanukasi is a hummingbird. He said, oh, I want black, like a, ba a black vest. And I want a, he had long beak. He said, I want a black beak and um, red head or something. But anyway, they all got different colors, but the last two that were in the line were were me Godiuk. They were fighting. They wouldn't leave each other alone. They uh, they just their hands are on each other or their what do you call on each other? They were pecking at each other and just not behaving and. Uh, they were last. So when they, when they came, when they came up to Nanabushu, he said, oh, they said, we want our colors. We, you know, we want, and he said, I only have black left. If you were paying attention, you could have been here. You know, you, you could have got your colors, but 
you were fighting and you were not listening. And he said, that's all I have is black. Is black is all I have left. So the, I, it was a uh, ondig, the crow and the raven that, that uh, got painted. They got there, they were white, but then he, he uh, colored them black. Like you see ondig is dark black, I mean, really black. And that's another story. But that's, uh, okay. Anybody have any questions or, or whatever? We want me to talk about anything else? Karen, we do have a, a few questions. I might throw those at you first, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Um, first and foremost, we have somebody who who's interested in learning about your responsibilities as a namer. And they were wondering if it's appropriate if you could share some yeah. of the names. Mm -hmm. I could share that. Uh, well, in first of all, in order to give an Indian name, you have to go through the Medea Lodge before you do before you do anything like that. And uh, my grandma used to tell me a long time ago, she said, you know, she said, when you're first born, you're a baby, she said, and you're a little baby. She said, there's some, an old man or an old woman that's gonna come to you. And he's gonna tell you what path you're gonna take say when you when you're gonna if you're gonna live how old you're gonna be when you pass away or how you know how everything like that what you're gonna do in life and but she said you don't remember you don't remember what you were told and uh, that's a part of the commit suicide story she told us she said Say you're a baby, and that 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 old man tells you uh, you're gonna live till you're 85 or something, and um, and then you end up in uh, your teens or your 20s. You're having a lot of problems, and you you end up. Uh, killing yourself or committing suicide she said you're not going to go anywhere she said you're going to be lost she said your soul is going to be going around and around and around until you're 85 until you were meant to go and then you will go and you know that's uh that's what she told me about you know so I stressed that a lot to my young kids and people but uh, anyway about naming they used to tell us the minute you're a baby you have to uh you have to get your name don't wait don't wait till you're 20 or you know um uh, get it right away i in in order to get a name they give that for they gave me some tobacco. This was my little granddaughter. She was only three, four days when I gave her a name. Like right now, they, they don't even have to go in the hospital long and they let, they let them out. So she got home that day and she heard her, her husband come and gave me some Sama. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll let you know when I have a, a dream about the naming. So here that same night, I put my tobacco out and I talked a little bit. Here that night, I had a dream about that baby. And uh, I was down my old house down there where I grew up at as a child. My grandpa had a great big garage 
it was a, an old log house made, of, you know, he had everything in there. And in my dream, I could see that, that old garage way in a distance. And I, I started walking toward it. I was gonna say, I wanna go see what's over there. So I started walking, but as I got closer and closer, I could hear like a big pounding, like, a, like how it would sound like in a tinsmith building where they're pounding on iron or whatever. And uh, I got closer and closer and I opened that door and I could see a man on, at a table. He had his back to me when I walked in. He kept pounding, but he wouldn't turn around to see me. So I walked behind him and I looked who that was. And he was making a great big rose out of a golden, golden ro uh, a rose. It had the prettiest petals on there, nicely shaped. And I seen who that man was. And I knew who that man was. And he turned around and he handed me that golden. He wouldn't say, he wouldn't say nothing. He, Did we lose you, Karen? Um, I don't know. Wait now. No. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I don't know what happened for a while. But anyway, he turned around and he handed me that that rose because I was big. And uh, it was big. And I walked out carrying that rose. And when I walked out, I woke up. And it geeks cozy, I woke up and I was saying, there's my dream. There's my baby, my little grand, great granddaughter's name. So I called her the next morning and I said, uh, I said, you know what? I said, I got your name. And uh, she said, oh, good. I said, when do you want to name her? I told her what to get. I said, get some, get your gun. I said, get the, get like four gifts, Sama, whatever you want. I said, get it. And uh, hang on, I'm going to get Anthony, my Anthony. Come in here. My battery's going out. Can you plug it in for me? Right there. Plug it into my phone. Yeah. Where does it go? Where which way? There, can you see me again? Hi. Yeah. Okay, something happened with my phone. Well anyway, well, anyway, I, I told her, get ready. I said, I'll come name the baby at your mom's house Monday morning. So I went there and I told her, and I ended, I told her I had to tell her my dream. I had to tell her an Indian because she hardly knew. And I, there was like four elders there, they come. And I told her my dream when I told all of them what I had about my dream. And, and she, uh, she said, uh, well, what's the name? I said, her Indian name is Ogini, Junia, that's gold. 
gold is uh, golden. Uh, rose is uh, Ogini. That's Golden Rose. That was her name. That's how I got her name with that dream of that golden rose. Ozawa Junia Oginig, that's her name. But uh, yeah, you have to you have to go through Medewi and you have to know your language before you can give names. You can't just go and give her any old name. And there's some people around that that just give names. They don't even know how to use it. They don't even know the language. And then they give them Indian names in uh, in English. You know, that ain't right. You know, because you know, the spirits are there. And that's how you, there's a lot of things that you have to cook cook and feed the spirits, but you only give a little bit, like you have to cook like wild rice, blueberries, you know, something from the wild. Um, and then you only, you only get each like a tablespoon and then they pass the baby around for everybody to say her name and kiss her on the forehead. And you know, that's probably toward the end of the, the naming naming ceremony, but I named quite a bit, quite a bit of my, my, uh, if you're meant to have a name, like my, uh, my grandson's wife, she was meant to have a name and uh, she got it late, but I had that dream of her You have a lot of people saying miigwech, miigwech for sharing. You have you have some audience from way over in uh, Wabanong, uh, uh, Little Traverse Bay saying they will put some asema down for you. Mm -hmm. Miigwech for sharing what you know. Yeah, miigwech. Yeah, that's what I said. I want to teach all my kids even the people on on Boys Fort, you know, how it was a long time ago, you know, like I said, all reservations ain't the same, you know. Some, I know my uh, my friend, he's as old as I am, and there's just me and him and the Good Sky Boys, two of them, four of us around here, and uh, there's just four, we had to go and new in. And you know the what's gonna happen when we're gone? Who's gonna teach the kids? You know who's? Uh, yeah, just uh, and I I don't want I I sometimes I I want to give up. I say I'm gonna give up. I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna quit this. Nobody's learning. But you know what happens? I'll go to sleep. And I'll have a dream of something or somebody coming to me and asking me something. Then right then when I get up again, I'll, you know, or I'll dream of an uh, animal. But there is so much more to learn about, you know, naming and animals, the clans, how they help you. You know, like uh, lately I've been uh, helping out in uh, burial ceremonies. They used to have, uh, they have, they have to have one lady there. If it's a lady that's, that's uh, passing on, they have to have one lady there. And they, they had like three men, me, me and then uh, the other three in case, you know, there's, like the lady has to put the moccasins on the lady and the men have to, you know, put the moccasins on the men. That's just the Indian burial. Then right there, they get their 
face painted, but not the whole face, just a little dot of red on their forehead. That's all they get. See, like there's different uh, uh, Anishinaabe that paint their whole face, you know, maybe half. That's a different, uh, a different, uh, different reservation or whatever, you know, we ain't all the same. We do things different, you know, and I do the, I do things that we did around here and that I watched my grandparents and the, the other elders around here. So I do things their way. And like other reservations, you know, there's no wrong way, you know, it's just the way that they believe and they you know different dialects and all that and you know just uh, just the way it is I guess mm -hmm. Jimmy Gwetch Karen for sharing mm -hmm. we hope you keep sharing well mm -hmm. into the future yeah if I I hope I can, I'm 75 now and, but uh, I was thinking my mom died when she was 78 and you know, I lost her. And uh, I think, uh, you know, my dad froze to death when he was only 30, but I didn't know him, you know, like I said, he'd only come see me in New Year's Eve and he'd be drunk and he'd have a bag of apples and that was all. So, but then somebody was saying, you know what they say that, that uh, the age your mom passed away, that's when you're gonna. I said, I don't know. I, I never really paid attention to anybody, you know. I guess, you know, that's the way, that's the way we, have to be, you know, and we just uh, wait for our time, you know, when we don't know when it's going to come or we just have to wait and hope that we can go for a full circle, you know. Yeah, like my husband, I, he passed when we were married 52 years and I learned a lot from him too. He was fluent and he knew a lot. He worked with kids. He went four years at UMD. He all worked with kids. He was fluent and he helped a lot of people sober up. You know, although he was a he was a chronic alcoholic when when he we were first married. And he we came in. Yeah, and I seen so much of. The, of my friends' kids being taken away. I said, I don't want my kids to be taken away from me. You know, I don't want them put in a home or wherever. I said, I. that's why I worked so long. I worked like, a, I can't even remember, like 39, 40 years at Head Start. And, and I did teach language there, but the parents didn't know it, so the kids didn't know it. I'd come, I'd come back in the fall and to work and school, and the kids would would forget it already because they weren't being taught by by their parents in the summertime, or they didn't have no teaching in the summertime. Because in order to learn your language, you got to hear it every day. Every day you got to hear it. Are you tired of sharing? No. Go ahead. What a, anybody want any question? Any other question? Well, hey, Karen. Um, would you be opposed to us talking about Sturgeon and talking about 1854's monitoring programs for a while? And then we'll we'll ask some questions. 
Yeah. You stick around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, awesome. No, it'll be good to have you because we, we do have a few more questions popping up for you, but let's give these guys a minute to talk about Name. So, Nick and Tony, do you guys want to take it away? Yeah. So, Nick, share the screen and then I'll be ready to go. Unless he's sleeping. <laughs> All right, thanks, Nick. Jimmy Gwetch, Karen, for sharing your stories. And thank you, Marty, Michelle, and Kasha for all the legwork on setting up this series. Uh, my name is Tony Anselmo, and I'm a fish and wildlife technician with the 1854 Treaty Authority. So today I'm gonna to give you a little quick history lesson on Lake Sturgeon, the local area, and then I'll talk a little bit about their biology as well. After that, um, I'll hand it over to Nick, our fisheries biologist, and he will go into detail on some of the projects that we do on the St. Louis River and Lake Superior. Next slide, please. The Lake Sturgeon is the oldest native freshwater species in the Great Lakes region. They were once very abundant in the many tributaries that are connected to the Great Lakes, but today, most of these populations are only a fraction of what they used to be. This is largely due to the construction of dams, um, exploitation from fishing and pollution in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Although they have a muddled past, Lake Sturgeon are resilient and their future is not as bleak as their past. Many agencies today, including tribal, state and federal partners across the Great Lakes region have committed to reintroducing the Lake Sturgeon to its native rivers as well as restoring degraded habitat. Next slide. As many of you probably know, the St. Louis River flows into the southwestern corner of Lake Superior. The sturgeon population here nearly went extinct in the early 1900s, but thanks to water quality improvements in the 70s and 80s, as well as stocking efforts by the Wisconsin and Minnesota Departments of Natural Resources, Lake Sturgeon are making a comeback. One of the main reasons lake sturgeon are so susceptible to population declines is because of their long lifespan. They're able to live to over 100 years old, and because of this long lifespan, they have a slow rate of growth to maturity and aren't able to naturally reproduce until later in life. This usually occurs around 20 to 25 years old for females and 10 to 15 years old for males. And lake sturgeon also do not spawn annually like most fish. Um, the females typically spawn every three to seven years and males usually like every two to five, which means that only 10 to 20% of adult sturgeon in a population will spawn in a given year, making it a longer recovery process when not aided by external resources such as stocking. Next slide. So now we'll get into the life stages of lake sturgeon. So females can lay anywhere from 50,000 to 1 million eggs in a single spawning season, depending on their health, age, and size. These eggs will remain attached to rocks below the water for five to eight days before hatching. This typically occurs in the spring of the year when the water temperature is around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. At this stage, eggs are very vulnerable to predation by other aquatic species such as crayfish, carp, and suckers. Also, if, legs are aid, if eggs are laid in too shallow of water, rapid reduction in water levels of rivers can lead to these eggs becoming exposed to air and becoming unviable. Next slide, please. After eggs hatch, lake sturgeon larvae will hide in the substrate for a few days before drifting downstream in search of nursery habitat. Nursery habitat is simply a place with adequate food cover and food availability where they can grow safely. They will usually drift at night during this time to avoid predation. And sturgeon at this stage are still very vulnerable to predation by other fish until their sharp scoots, scoots grow in later in the year. Next slide. These fish can grow as much as 12 inches in a single year and eventually develop bony structures, structures on their sides and back called scoops, which protect them from predators. So the blue arrow on this slide is pointing to some of the bony scoots on the back of this juvenile sturgeon. These scoots can be really sharp and make it a little bit difficult to work with the fish and measure, measure them. Um, I know I've definitely been cut up a few times and I think Nick has as well. As these fish grow in age, um, these scoots will oftentimes wear down and eventually are no longer needed when they have outgrown most of their predators. 
By the time they are sub-adult or adult lake sturgeon, humans and lampreys are the only known predators. Next slide. So now we'll move on to the adult stage. And as you can see in this fish, um, the scoots are no longer as razor sharp and they're pretty worn down. Many adults, um, once they're older, will move from their natal rivers into the Great Lakes or other lakes that are connected to these rivers. Most will reside in these areas, feeding in shallow waters until they are ready to spawn, at which time they will migrate back up the streams of the river that they were hatched, which can sometimes be as much as 100 miles. This type of migration to natal rivers is called homing behavior or homing migration, and is also observed in many salmon species. This migration for lake sturgeon happens in the spring of the year. It is also known that not all sturgeon will migrate out to lakes. Um, some sturgeon have been hooked up with telemetry. Acoustic telemetry data has shown that some of these sturgeon will remain in the rivers year round without any outward migration to lakes. And some quick facts about adult lake sturgeon. They can reach lengths of seven to eight feet long and weigh over 200 pounds. Although this is pretty rare and most fish we see are between like the three to five foot range and weigh between 10 and 30 pounds. And the one in this picture here was 60 inches long and weighed 50 pounds. Next slide. Lake sturgeon diet. So they primarily feed on benthic macroinvertebrates, uh, which include snails, crayfish, insect larvae, clams, and worms. They use their barbels to help them locate food on the bottoms of lakes and rivers. And as you can see in the picture, uh, barbels look kind of like whiskers. And there are sensory organs located near the mouth that help them detect food in murky waters. Once the prey is found, it is sucked in by the extension of their protractable mouths, as you can also see in this picture. So now that you have a little background in lake sturgeon biology, I'll give you a quick rundown of some restoration projects that have been completed on the St. Louis River, which have likely contributed to the success of natural reproduction in recent years. Next slide. So in 2009, rock riffles were created below the Fond du Lac Dam using large boulders placed in the river, and this disrupted the river current and created spawning pools for lake sturgeon and other species of fish. Then in 2015, another restoration project was completed at Chambers Grove Park. Here, a thousand feet of shoreline were restored and stabilized to a more natural state. Three spawning structures were also created to provide habitat for lake sturgeon, walleyes, and longnose suckers. Then in 2011, biologists from the Fond du Lac Resource Management Division documented success of natural reproduction of sturgeon below the dam during a spring drift netting survey. Since then, the Resource Management Divisions from Fond du Lac and the 1854 Treaty Authority have partnered to conduct annual surveys when river conditions allow. Six out of eight surveys since 2011 have documented larval fish production. This means that adult sturgeon are spawning and their eggs are surviving at least to the larval stage. Next slide. So to sample these fish, we set nets in the river bottom. And after this is, happens after observed spawning in the spring of the year, we set the net, nets at dusk and they are checked every hour until about midnight. So water flows through the net and fish are collected at the cod end in a PVC canister. And so after the hour, we'll pick up the nets and check the PVC canisters and count any sturgeon that may have been caught. Once we have counted them, we'll return them to the river where they can continue drifting downstream. So since 2011, we have sampled over 1,000 larval sturgeon. And because we only sample a small portion of the, of the river, we suspect there are many more larval fish that we aren't collecting in our nets and hopefully surviving into the more mature life stages. Future trawling surveys might give us an idea if there's successful recruitment into these stages. Next slide. So in 2019, we caught almost 500 larval sturgeon in one sampling night. And this video here shows some larval fish that came out of just one net that night. So we were hopeful to see some of these fish reach adulthood in the coming years. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to 1854's fisheries biologist, Nick Bogio. We'll give you some more information on other sturgeon projects that we do on the river. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I will now be giving an overview on three other sturgeon projects we conduct or we conduct at 1854. The first one I'll be discussing is our bottom trawl surveys conducted on the St. Louis River. So to give you a little background on these bottom trawl surveys, Eurasian ruff, which is an invasive species, were discovered in the St. Louis River estuary in 1987. For the monitor ruff and native species, USGS 
based out of Ashland, Wisconsin, initiated regular bottom trawl surveys. In the early years of monitoring, trawl surveys were conducted about every two weeks throughout the open water season. In the year, these surveys led to the discovery of round goby in 1995, which is also an invasive species. Over time, due to lack of funding and available personnel, these surveys were done seasonally in the spring, summer, and fall. From 2004 to 2009, trawl surveys were discontinued altogether due to lack of funding. In 2010, the 1854 Treaty Authority received GLRI funding from the BIA to reinstate these bottom trawl surveys. The funding allowed us to purchase equipment, fund personnel, and contract the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to provide their trawl vessel and captain. Then in 2015, we received GLRI funding to purchase our own trawling vessel. In 2016, our vessel was fully operational and we began conducting three seasonal surveys once again. So if you're unfamiliar what a trawl net is, <clears throat> this picture down here should show it. It's not perfect, but it's an ocean dwelling boat. But um, it's essentially what they use, it's essentially what they use in the ocean to harvest uh, shrimp. The nets we use are four feet tall by 16 feet wide. These two orange doors right here are angled, so under the power of the boat actually spreads the net. And then along the bottom here is chains to keep it running on the bottom. And then here's floats here to keep the net open. <clears throat> um, so this is our vessel here. This is, a, we call it a boom, and it's got a winch here with a cable that comes down. And these are our two doors. And uh, once we get to the location, we're gonna drop it. We drop it about three to five times the depth to make sure it's running on the bottom. Um, and then once we're retrieving it, we use a, a generator to power this winch. And then we were able to pull this back end of the net in and dump out the fish. Um, the three main objectives of this trawl survey are to monitor population trends of native and non-native species, surveillance for new invasive species, and a means of documenting recruitment of sturgeon. So uh, as I stated before, we've conducted a spring survey in the beginning of May, a summer survey in the beginning of August and a fall survey at the beginning of, of October since 2016. We also uh, conduct periodic trawl surveys specifically targeting juvenile sturgeon whenever time permits. So as Tony showed before, this here is a map of the St. Louis River. This is the study area is located between Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. Um, the map shows the three habitat types. Um, I'll get into more of what these habitat types mean on the next slide, but these are this blue is considered our dredge channels. This purple, if you can see it here, is undredged channels. And this lighter color here is our flats. Um, so um, also I wanna show in this picture, um, USGS also divided the river into two, 216 grids and they all, and they were given six um, specific digit numbers to uh, differentiate them between each other. So um, before each of the trawls, I randomly select 40 uh, grids and with a couple extra just in case of obstructions and then uh, use GIS to pinpoint the starting location, which allows us to stay in the grid the entire tow. So to get behind the methods. So each trawl survey consists, be, consists of 40 tows. 25 tows are in the flat habitat, which I mentioned earlier, which are less than three meters of water. Seven are undredged channels, which are three to nine meters, and eight are dredged channels, which are greater than nine meters. Each tow is five minutes in duration at 2.4 miles an hour. Following each tow, the net is emptied and the fish are separated by species and measured. All fish are returned to the water except for invasive species, which include rough brown goby, tube nosed goby, and white perch. So as I stated earlier, the third objective of these surveys is to document successful lake sturgeon recruitment following restoration efforts by Minnesota and Wisconsin DNR. In 2011, as Tony stated earlier, the first natural reproduction was documented in our larval drift net surveys in the spawning restoration site below the Fond du Lac Dam. Since then, we've documented natural reproduction multiple times, as you will see on the next slide. So we know sturgeon are having spawning success in the river, but we're not seeing much recruitment to date. So in other words, we're seeing, we're seeing larvae and many adults, but we're not seeing that intermediate size of juveniles. These pictures are a few examples that we've captured in our trawl surveys. 
that are a sign of natural reproduction. The two on the right are from 2015, and the one on the left is from this past field season. As you can see here, our larval drift nets, we've captured a relatively low number of larvae from 2011 to 2018, ranging from, two to, or from zero to 46 samples. In our 2019 larval drift net survey, we sampled over a thousand larval sturgeon. So at this point, we don't know if the catch in 2019 was an anomaly or if spawning success is increasing or maybe our timing and methods is more honed in. Only continuing sampling will tell what the future holds. This here is a hypothetical graph we would like to see in a perfect world 20 to 30 years from now, where when we see higher reproductive success, we start seeing better recruitment and survival. Continuing this long-term data set will reveal some pattern in larvae versus recruitment, whether it's positive, negative, or otherwise. We hope to eventually see, um, we, we hope to eventually be able to correlate our sturgeon reproduction and our larval drift net sampling to our recruitment in our trawling surveys. So in other words, when we start seeing numbers, larger numbers of larvae in our drift nets, we eventually want to start seeing more juveniles in our trawling surveys. This will only be done with the continuation of these long-term data sets. As you can see, some data collection may not be significant from year to year, but years down the road, it might hold vital information on management practices, habitat improvement or degradation, or in very long-term instances, climate change. Another survey I will touch on is our Lake Superior Juvenile Index Survey. This survey is conducted every five years on all tributaries with current or extirpated populations lakewide. 1854 has been involved with this survey since it began in 2011. For the second lakewide survey in 2016, we were able to conduct our own survey with our newly acquired vessel. Since then, we've continued these surveys on an annual basis. basis. <clears throat> For this survey, a thousand foot gill nets are set and pulled over the course of three days in the beginning of August. Each net consists of 600 feet of four and a half inch mesh, 200 feet of eight inch mesh and another 200 feet of 10 inch mesh. The objectives of this survey are to monitor recruitment, year class strength and population trends over time. So to give you a little background on our sturgeon workup. So all sturgeon captured besides larvae obviously are measured, weighed, a genetic fin clip is taken, a pectoral fin ray is taken for aging and an external floy tag shown down here with the floy tag gun is inserted into the base of the fin and contains 1854 contact information. <clears throat> Each fish also receives a passive integrated transponder, also known as a pit tag, which is shown here. It's inserted into the second dorsal scoot. And you can show, you can see Tony is inserting one up here. These pit tags have a unique 15 digit numerical code on them that can be read by a scanner when the fish is recaptured. These are much like the uh, tags that people put in their pets and like dogs and cats. The workup information is all entered into the St. Louis River database, pit tag database run by the Minnesota DNR, where upon recapture metrics such as growth, habitat residency, spawning frequency, and eventually a population est estimate may be obtained. So here, on the bottom here is a picture, just a picture of the cover of the report produced every five years. As I said before, just it's just our data is just one part of this lakewide group effort. All the partners in there, along with this survey, are in this table here, and all of our sampling locations are in this map up here. The next lakewide survey will be this summer, and it will be the third lakewide juvenile index survey to date. One last survey I'll touch on is one uh, we started in 2019 with the help of the US Fish and Wildlife Service out of Alpena, Michigan, where we began experimenting with set lines in the St. Louis River. A set line is essentially a, a trot line deployed offshore rather than tied to a bank. The picture in the lower right shows our setup. This main line here, which is also called the, uh, the mother line, has various lines coming off it with various size hooks. And all these hooks are baited with either cut bait or usually, usually what we're using is suckers, sucker cut bait. 
anchors on both ends keep this tight and then they're attached to buoys for retrieval. Um, we set, we tend to set, we've been practicing with these, but we tend to set in the St. Louis River in the fall when water temperatures are cooler so we don't, so we can prevent mortalities and we can set any time on the Lake Superior during the field season due to cooler temperatures. Set lines are deployed overnight and retrieved the following day. This past year with more experimenting of locations, hook sizes and bait types, we'll be standardizing this survey in 2021 field season. This here is a quick clip of Tony pulling in a set line. As you can see, they're still very lively. And you can see what these look like with this clip and the line there that disappeared. And then the picture to the right is actually the actual fish. I believe Tony needed a, a little hand with this one. It was a little powerful for him. So I think I gave him a hand on this one. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you'd like to access any of our reports, you can find them on the 1854 um, website under management, biological resources, and reports shown here. Marnie always keeps tabs on that and keeps us in line as far as all of our reports are put up on there on time. Um, also, if anyone would like any samples or data, we'd be more than happy to work with you to find or to get whatever you may need. And with that, I'd like to thank Fond du Lac, the Fond du Lac Resource Management Division, especially Brian Borkholder, their fisheries biologist, Minnesota DNR, Wisconsin DNR, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of Ashland. And with that, Tony, I will take any questions. Should I stop sharing this? I want to see him let go of the fish. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's free. He's free. Nick, I want to know if you guys have ever tried salt pork on your set lines. We have not. Mm -hmm. We have not tried good that. Good idea. It is a good idea. Maybe you should. <laughs> we ran into issues with stuff staying on the hook. So first we tried worms and they all got chewed off. Then we tried trout perch, which we we ended up having some success on that, but we found just cut suckers is probably their best bait. It stays on well and usually works pretty well. Well, we've run a little long and I want to um, give the floor to Keisha to run our drawing for this evening. Keisha, are you still with us? <laughs> I'm pushing buttons and it wasn't working. Okay. We have, let's see, we have five, uh, everyone included here. I'm going to share my screen. I'll lose you guys. Okay. Sorry, just one second. I apologize for this. There we go. Now I'll share my screen. All right. So I have names of everyone who was here this evening. And we have seven prizes. I will be sending you guys in. So email. here we go tomorrow. Watch for that. Congratulations and thanks to everyone who was here tonight. It was really, really good to see so many people. We'll hand it back to you, Marnie. Thank you much, Keisha. Um, we're, we are flooded with questions on sturgeon. So I'm gonna try to mix these up with uh, some more cultural stuff that, that I'm gonna throw to Karen too. But we do have somebody responding here with um, our old Anishinaabe fishermen use salt pork on the hooks along the Red River. So maybe it's a thing, guys. Maybe you should try right. it this year. Let's try anything. <laughs> um, we have one question about our pit tags. Uh, the information collected from pit tags shared collectively of Orbit, or is it um, just used within 1854 data? 
No, it is, it is shared collectively. There actually is a Great Lakes database for all the, all the lake, Great Lakes. So you can actually enter them in there and depending on if they're put in there or not, you should get a, you can actually tell what agency captured it and then you have to contact them and figure out all the logistics. But the one on the St. Louis River, Dan Wilfon from the Minnesota DNR put together, that one has all kinds of information as far as when they were captured, the gear types, um, lengths, weights, so you can kind of see growth over time and all that good stuff. So yes, they are shared. Uh, we have one question, two questions from Tom here. He wants to know if the sturgeon in the estuary go out through the ship canal or if they go all the way around Minnesota Point. They probably do a little bit of both. I haven't asked them. <laughs> How many fish have you yeah. caught on a set line at one time, like on one set line? I think it was, was it three or four? It was four out on the big lake this year, last year. Oh, that's right. That was fun. <laughs> that was only 13 hooks. So this this year, as when I said we were standardizing it, we'll have five of them and each one will have 18 hooks. We were just kind of trying to figure our way through this. But yeah, um, yeah, we had four on 13 hooks, which was pretty pretty good. It was nice and rough that day too, of course. So that was made it a little more interesting. That's cool. I uh, question from Lindsay here. How many tribal members are involved in these efforts? Um, I'm gonna take a first stab at that. Um, 1854 has a um, hiring preference to enrollees and descendants or those claiming heritage, um, which is a perfect segue. We, we have posted three resource management positions today. They are vacancies for seasonal positions that get to help out on each of our management projects, but whether it be fish, wildlife, wild rice, you name it, invasive species. Um, <clears throat> we're hoping to, to get the word out near and far. Um, and then she goes on to ask, are, the, are these positions entry level or expanded long-term positions? And um, I think we've had both of you on as short term first, and it kind of you stuck around because of your good work, right? I like to think that, yeah, yeah. I've been here almost ten years, and I started off with uh, two six months positions, and then I got hired on full time. So, and I also started out uh, as just a six month fish and wildlife aide. Now I've been here for three years. So. Started out entry level. Here's a good question, and maybe Karen can answer this one too. Do sturgeon live in the northern Minnesota rivers? I'm thinking Big Fork or Rainy River. I know for sure they live on the uh, uh, Rainy. I'm not sure about the Big Fork River though, but it is, Big Fork is a tributary, so I can imagine that they also go up into there too. Karen, can you unmute yourself? I know that there's still some folks that do catch sturgeon that live in that lake. Where are they catching sturgeon around you yet? On our lake. I'm assuming they're not in the lake, they're in a river, aren't they? Yeah, they were at, they were in Little Fork River. But now, no, I don't think nobody ever goes there anymore to Little Fork River to, to do sturgeon. I, I see that when I was about eight years old, where they would go in the spring, and I haven't seen that ever since. Same with netting on, on our lake, no, never, uh, been years and years and years since anybody set net or fished on, on our lake. Wow. Oh, cool, Miigwech. Hey, I got a question here from Lindsay. Um, can the TAG data be comprised and claimed by non-participating organizations or programs? I'll take that one. Um, it's like when I talked about the Floyd TAG, that's an external TAG, so they would be able to see, an or ours are orange TAGs and it has our contact information, our phone number, and uh, 
know, obviously 1854 on it. So they would be able to call us on it. But as far as the PIPSAG data that you need, you need a special reader for that. So probably not. Molly Johnson asks, or Jordan, excuse me, how are local native people involved in sturgeon conservation? Along with the evaluation, we're gonna send out an email tomorrow. Uh, we're also gonna send a bunch of resources, whether it be cultural, historical, or scientific based um, on sturgeon specifically. But there's a lot of information there how, how native communities around the Midwest are uh, supporting bringing sturgeon back or supporting just, just being stewards of the, the sturgeon in their local waterways. Are there safety guidelines for eating sturgeon? No. The St. Louis <laughs> <laughs> Um Well, right now, and that's uh, to my knowledge, it's, just a, it's not really a catch, it's just a catch and release. Or I, I don't even know if you're supposed to target them out there, but um, so you're not supposed to keep them and eat them, at least from the river, because the population is still kind of making a comeback. So. And I'm not positive about this, but I think Fond du Lac has something written in their code. They can keep one a year. I don't think they do because I talked to some, we're in uh, collaboration with Fond du Lac, like I said earlier. And so a couple of their band members always come down to do our larval gif net surveys and stuff. And I always said, hey, have you ever harvested one? He's like, from here? I don't think so. <laughs> well, probably a better, better to be safe, but yeah. I was going to say I had some smoked sturgeon from Pete Isham up in Net Lake last year, two years ago. I don't know where that was caught, but it wasn't from down here. It must have been up there somewhere. Next time I get some smoked sturgeon, Karen, I'm going to share it with you. Maybe they, they are still, maybe they are still getting sturgeon. That's who does it, Pete Isham. Nobody else, I don't think. Yeah. Well, guys, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do have one last question for Karen. Um, oh, one of our prize winners who's a student at UMD. Ariana asks, how would food be stored back in the day in winter time? How would you store meat? How would you store rice? How would you store blueberries and other medicines? Okay. They, my grandparents used to store rice. They dig big holes in the ground, and they'd have uh, like uh, they do a lot of deer hides. They'd uh, they would uh, tan them deer hides or a moose hide or something where it's real big, and they keep that in great big high hole. They dig big holes. And that's where they would keep their wild rice. And it wouldn't even be finished. It would be, they, if whenever in the spring when they needed it, they'd go take it out. Same thing, we didn't have a refrigerator. And my mom and my grandma, when my mom was around, she would, they would dig big holes again and they'd have these tin, these big tin cans uh, they would get from, uh, People would come and um, bring people, other Indians here, cans or stuff, like big tubs of lard and stuff. And that's how they would uh, store the meat in butter or lard. They ne we never had butter, but she'd steal, uh, you know, put them in a hole there and wrap them up good. And, you know, and there'd be a tight cover on there, but the rice would be with within the uh, like hides or something, and that's how they would uh, keep their meat uh, and their lard from you no know, melting. That's what I have now. I have a, I keep my meat outside, but it's going to be warm, so I'll have to. I have a refrigerator, but. It's full now, so I have to put a little bit extra meat outside, and I, I just use a, uh, what do you call them, kind of 
cold, uh, cold pails. I just cover it up so no, 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 nothing can get at it. So, and that's how they stored wild rice. And then in the springtime, they dig up that rice if, if you were out, but nobody was, nobody would ever run out of rice. And my grandpa and grandma had a great big underground cellar. They had like a eight with a big wire, a big handle, and they'd lift it up this way that you'd go down in little stairs and there'd be a shelves of canned duck, canned blueberries, everything they, they used, they got and they'd, for the winter and they would uh, can them. And I remember Thanksgiving, we didn't have nothing to eat at all, but we had wild rice. And my grandma cooked it in a great big black skillet, but we didn't have salt either. But that was good, you know, even though, because they didn't believe in, we didn't even know about Thanksgiving, I think. So that's what we eat. We always had wild rice. Never went hungry, especially if there was no deer. There's you know, no deer out there to hunt. Yeah, and rich um, camp. that's and huge. Thank you so much, you guys. We really appreciate everything that everyone has contributed tonight. Um, I know that folks have to get rolling and get kids to bed. Any last words from you, Keisha? No, I just this was fantastic. Thanks so much, everyone. Jimmy Gwetch, Karen, Jimmy Gwetch, Tony, and Nick for all your knowledge, too. And uh, Right, Thank you, out. Marty. Have a good night, guys. You too. Gigawaba men, Minawa. Good one. Gigawaba men, Wabang. <laughs>